to Never Show the Monster. I'm Kelly Attaway, and my co-host is Chelsea Hollander. And in this episode, we continue exploring 2020's The Empty Man. As a refresher, we are following the character James, an ex-detective investigating a missing teenager, the deaths of some of those teens' friends, a weird-ass cult they were wrapped up in called the Pontifax Institute, and how all of this somehow relates to the urban legend of The Empty Man. So it's day two. So he goes into this old building and it's in the middle of a city. I don't know if it's in the middle of Webster City or it's in St. Louis. There are scenes later in the movie in St. Louis. So that's why it would lead me to believe that. So he goes into this old building that we're supposed to believe is the Pontifex Institute. And he talks to a front desk lady who seems like a robot. Oh, it's like difficult. Yeah, she's, she's like, we were established in 2013. What would we offer here? It's as old as time. And I was like, great slogan. She's like physically monochromatic. Yes. Like she's long blonde hair, very pale, vacant eyes. Are you describing me? You don't have vacant eyes. Look again. I can't see now. <laughs> <laughs> so you and I are both pale, but she was like paper. Look, we are both very pale. I think we are as pale as she is. No, we've got rosy cheeks. I guess that that's accurate. But she is, like, she just responds in catchphrases almost. And then she's like, here, um, you can fill this form out, which is a questionnaire, which I assume is a scale because they are statements. The scientific method is a tool of oppression. That's the one I remembered. Yeah, yeah, it's one of the first things he looks at. And I was like, oh, shit. I was like, I love the scientific. But if you hearken back to what Amanda says, you're like, you're right. Nothing's real. Nothing's real. Fuck. Shit. Mm. What were some of the others? Do you remember them? The brain can itch. Oh, that's true. But those are the two main ones that jumped out. And I was like, is that scale one to five? Yeah, I somewhat agree. (laughs) Is that a number four? Yeah, I somewhat agree. Not five. I I don't strongly agree. I I guess this is where I'm at. (laughs) And then they go into an auditorium and then they hear this in like... He's not an evangelist, but he's definitely a leader of this Pontifex Institute, who Kelly and I spent like 10 minutes before we started <laughs> recording looking him up. He is the guy that's in everything, literally yeah, you everything. Know you know Bill him. in King of the Hill, Milton in Office Space, Dwight in Pushing Daisies. Yeah. Uh, the father of Boyle, Boyle father in, in Brooklyn, Brooklyn Nine-Nine. Nine. Anyway, he's in everything. We love him. So happy to see him. I think he's only done gold, and I'm glad that this was part of the gold that he did. Yeah, he does great in this scene. And he, once again, this is something that I I wrote down a lot of lines, and I was like, I can't get enough lines from this guy in this because it is so good. There are so many words in this movie. (laughs) (laughs) He's talking to the crowd, and while he's going on this monologue he like keeps making eye contact with james but he's saying you're here looking for something you have lost there is nothing you have lost there is no such thing as loss there is no struggle he says you are complete in yourself and then he he says how much less space can you occupy yeah he's like our current society is like how do you reach farther and do more and be bigger and he was like no what we really need to be asking is how much less can you do which i thought was crazy there are parts of this that i'm like that's interesting mm-hmm. um i'm not trying to buy into the philosophy of everything in this but you You're know i'm to always took up by this cult i mean <laughs> i i just want acceptance i mean i'm vulnerable but when he was talking about it i was like oh i don't want to make myself i was like i spent a lot of my life making myself tiny Yeah. You're asking for people to make themselves tinier. But you find out, like, kind of why he talks about right and wrong or exclusionary constructs. Yeah, he says there is no such thing as disunity. Yes. There is only the great binding nothingness of things. And then he, does he end it or does he just say this message comes to you from the empty man? He definitely says that, yeah. And everyone in the crowd is uh, like late teens, early 20s, you know, mm-hmm. prime cold age, 30 seconds tomorrow, so you're, you're trapping them in. And he goes, <laughs> <laughs> James, not Jeremy. Thank you notes. Oh, I thought um, you were talking about Jared. Jared, Jared Leto. Yeah, because yeah. he started that cult, right? 
I know, but on I that island, yeah, I can't tell if it's a legitimate cult or if that's did like we a talk fun about this before? branding thing they're doing. I don't think we've talked about it before. I've gone back and forth, and the more I learn about it, I think it's a cult. You think it's a cult? Okay, I, I haven't looked know. into it at all. I go back and forth. You guys, write in. Let us know. <laughs> <laughs> he was selling like beanies that were like Jared Leto's cult, and I was like, mm, cult. Okay, cult whenever you cult. buy into the cult status, then. I don't know. Is he trying to... Yeah, is this like reverse psychology? I don't know. Oh, my God. He's not smarter than us. We heard about what he did in Suicide Squad. No. But is this no. Like, but is this no. PR manager smarter than us? Maybe. Maybe. You know what? Maybe. So, uh, after this... Yeah, where are ...monologue, we? Milton from Office Space is like meeting and greeting the people. Yeah, and then James goes up to talk to him. And then he says, the empty man is a manifestation of our thoughts. Basically, the sum of our thoughts, very much like a virus. Arthur Parsons is the name of the the leader there that was speaking. So Arthur is going on to describe um, that there is a veil between forms and flesh. And I've only got like pieces of the quotes because it's a very long piece. And it happens so fast. <laughs> and it, But all of it's good. All like the writing good. in this... Fucking on point. Love it. So I, I do want to set up the scene a little bit before yes, we get into do. specifically what he's saying, because it's so surreal. So uh, Arthur Parsons, you said is his name? Yes, Arthur. He's like engaged with a, a group of these youths who are who were in the audience. And James comes up and approaches him. And they sort of walk off together and sit down next to each other in front of the stage. And the group of youths that he was talking to just like form an audience around them. And they're like staring. They they aren't even really reacting. They're just staring at them while this conversation is happening. And he's, he starts talking about the Noah sphere, which I had to look up. Did you know what it was? Oh, I did not. Is this one of the things that you were like, I have to look up? Yeah, this was a word. He said the word. Is it K-N-O-W or N-O-W? It's N-O-O-S-P-H-E-R-E. Although the second O has a little a little guy over it. Gotcha. Yeah, noosphere. I just did like a quick search for it, but it's essentially the collective unconscious. He's going on about how um, it's the same thing that Amanda was saying earlier, that like thoughts come from somewhere else and Mm -hmm. like thoughts exist in this other space and maybe they just come to us from the other space and that's the noosphere and he also starts talking about how a thought can be dangerous but that danger is dulled by repetition and Mm. the example he gives is that Nietzsche quote I think he first um, talks about him saying the name multiple times like yeah when you're young and you say your name multiple times then it becomes gibberish yeah same thing with complex ideas Mm -hmm. so he's like when you stare into the abyss the abyss stares back into you Mm -hmm. uh and he's like yeah that doesn't mean anything anymore like we've all heard it a thousand times that doesn't mean anything but like when you really think about it like you're looking into the abyss because something in the abyss is calling to you and if the abyss is looking into you that means that something inside you is calling to the abyss. So like, wow, that's a crazy <laughs> idea. <laughs> so good. <laughs> so crazy. <laughs> and I remember on the first watch, I was like, mm, this is some crazy talk. On my mm-hmm. second watch, I was like, holy fuck. Yeah. This is some not crazy talk. I know what he's mm-hmm. saying. Oh, my God. Yeah. <laughs> and then he ends it with, I'm so glad you came back. <gasps> So scary. And James is like, I've never been here before. And then the guy says, oh, must be something about you. And then he's like, well, okay. And then we're like, what's, what's going on? What? So the audience is like, what? What's what? happening? So then he goes and he asks this random dude if he's seen Amanda. And he says, nah. And then he's immediately like, bullshit. And then he begins to wander the building. He's a little intrepid explorer. Yeah. And he goes to a strange dormitory, which... So first he walks and there's just a ton of beds with shoes and then he walks a little bit and then he gets to a point where there's like a group of people sitting and they're staring at that same black void poster that he's seen Mm -hmm. in all of the, all of the rooms and they're doing the click whispers. Did you hear what, did you hear the recording that was playing? What were they? What was it? Oh my God. Okay. So while he's walking down the dormitory, there is a recording 
going and it's saying, it's on a loop. It's saying nothing exists. Mm. Even if something exists, nothing can be known about it. Even if something can be known about it, knowledge about it cannot be communicated to others. Even if Mm -hmm. it can be communicated, nothing about it can be understood. And that's just on a loop. Which is not wrong. No, I think that that's wrong. (laughs) Well, no, if you think about it, well, like, I think Einstein came out with a thing that was like, nothing is 100% because you have to question the intelligence of the car. I think the example given was like a map. And you had to question the legitimacy of the cartographers. Like every part of it had to be 100%. So for you to be 100% on something, the person who founded the like theory or whatever it is has to be 100% infallible. I think that these are two different things. For example, you just communicated something to me and I understood it. Mm -hmm. I agree that communication is lossy, Mm -hmm. but like (laughs) nothing exists. But once again, this is another part in the movie where it's just telling you exactly what's going on. Yeah. mm -hmm. And you're like, okay, chill, 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 chill. What the fuck? (laughs) But it's telling you exactly what's happening. You guys haven't caught on yet? If not, that's okay. No, you haven't caught on. We watched the actual movie. It took me two watches. (laughs) (laughs) I'm actually coming to the conclusion that... That you understand something more than I do. So I'm looking forward to you communicating that to me. That's nice of you. (laughs) (laughs) I'm glad you're leading this one. (laughs) Oh, thanks. That makes me feel so good. (laughs) So after all this, he sees these people chanting and doing their click noises. And Mm -hmm. then he's in this crazy archive that is dimly lit. Because, of course, as we know from horror movies in archives, dimly lit everything any library, anything with books, anything with catalogs, it's going to be dimly lit. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So he walks through and then you kind of see a quick glimpse of something that says manifestation. <gasps> I put 41, but I'm pretty sure it meant 14. I think you're right because later in the movie, he goes Grabs to this room it. and he goes directly to manifestation yeah. 14. So then he keeps going and he enters a tunnel that's underground and everything's kind of like wet and decrepit. And he... Comes upon this, like, very open warehouse-type area Mm -hmm. of people that are, like, kind of quietly chanting. Yeah, and he's, like, above them. They're on the ground floor, and he's, like, on the first floor on, like, another catwalk that overlooks them. And then he ends up accidentally making a noise, I think. And then Mm -hmm. um, they start talking like ghost hunters, which I really love. I know. (laughs) And they were like... That was you make a sound. We but hear before you. that, we're they listening. were chanting something crazy too. What were they chanting? They were saying, uh, from the bridge comes the man. From the man comes his thoughts. From his thoughts, from the power. From the power comes the bridge. This is why we're perfect from because I missed the man. all of that. <laughs> yeah, they just, they're just repeating it. And that comes back later in the movie. It does. So he makes a noise and they're like, we hear you. And then he peeks over the railing. Mm-hmm. And then the group picks up their empty bottles and begins blowing in them. Yeah. And then some creepy people in suits come and ask him to go with them. So then they kick him out of the building. And then the kid from earlier shows up and he's like, uh, you're a little young for the Neil Cassidy routine. Who the fuck is Neil Cassidy? I meant to look that up before this recording and I did not look it up. I know, I know. David Cassidy. Who's Neil Cassidy? I've heard Neil Cassidy. He's a writer? He's like, yeah. He's like calling them 1950s psychedelic counterculture. That checks yeah. out to ha- to his vibe. He's very much like Jack Kerouac. I was going to say, I thought he was a beatnik. He was prominently featured as himself in the scroll first draft of Jack Kerouac's On the Road. Oh, okay. So yeah, he was a bro to Kerouac. Yeah. So he's like, I don't know. He's, he's too cool for me to ever uh, be around. No, he's a dork. <laughs> <laughs> what are you talking about? But he's like, hey, you're you're a little young for the Neil Cassidy routine. The kid's like, mm, Amanda's been here. They're talking about taking her to the woods and getting her PR'd, which means pre-released, which is the mm-hmm. first step to singularity. And he was like, the fuck are you talking about, man? And yeah. then he kind of talks about the woods being a camp that they go to. Um, and then the Neil Cassidy child says that the guys are crazy and they don't have five-year plans. They have 500-year plans. So when it said Doomsday Cult, I was like, is it Doomsday or is it like, they just know what's going to happen. 
They don't know what's going to happen. But um, <laughs> do they? Like, do they? I feel confident. No. But like, even if you're like a doomsday cult can be like in a thousand years, we're going to die. Yeah, that's true. And also, if they have 500 year plans, like did those plans start 499 years ago? Or That's a good point. I don't know. I feel like we're being dropped into the middle of a big thing. Oh, yeah. There's like a huge conspiracy going on yeah. here. Many years before, prior to our our existence. We get like a little glimpse of the timeline at the very end, but it's one line and there's no exposition. Like yep. this is, who knows how long this has been going on. So we don't know where we're at in the timeline. We know that there is a timeline. We're not 100% sure, but somebody might know and he might be telling everyone, but we'll get to that. Or it, they. I don't know, dude. <laughs> I don't want to gender this because I feel like it's probably a they. So that's the line. Five-year plans, 500-year plans. And then the next shot is of a map that says Mark yeah. Twain Forest, and then it goes somewhere <laughs> near it. And then it, like, zooms in. Great shot. Goes from map to landscape. And then he he drives up. James drives up. And it, it looks like an empty, abandoned summer camp. Mm-hmm. And then he goes into the office. And it's not as dusty as I would expect. And that makes sense because it's still in use. Mm -hmm. Um, There's coffee and takeout and he goes to a file cabinet, but no one's there. And he starts sifting through the file cabinet, trying to find files on Amanda's friends. And he finds a decent amount of them, even with Evandra. Am I making a... Devara. Devara. Then he gets a file, a different color that has his name. It's red. Yes. And it says James Lambrosia. And he's like... No, no, Sombra. Sombra. (laughs) Uh, (laughs) ambrosia he's the feast of the gods why am i like this (laughs) but he he picks out his and it's empty it's just completely empty and he's like oh you're fucking with me he says that's funny yeah exactly (laughs) and then he leaves and he goes to like a bunk cabin and there's a crusty little teddy bear in the corner um he looks at it really quick and then he goes to an old tv and there are some vhs's around it which Mm -hmm. Ours dusty, as I would expect. So, good job on the bunkhouse. Mm -hmm. Very dusty. Um, And then he finds a videotape labeled Manifestation Number 13. Oh, yeah. I guess that's what it said. (laughs) Did you say Manifestation B? Sure did. (laughs) (laughs) Same thing. (laughs) Later, when he finds Manifestation 14, I was like, so we changed the whole numbering system. (laughs) I was just dumb. Got it. Got it. We got it. (laughs) Uh, So then he pops in the VHS, starts with a little bit of static, and then uh, you see five boys at a table chanting. And then it it turns. But they're doing the the same chant from the bridge. Okay. I did not hear the chant well, so I'm so Mm -hmm. glad you heard that. And then it kind of turns. There you hear a couple sounds, and then it turns to like a kind of a malnourished body. Uh It looks like, honestly, it looks like they were torturing a man or they had tied up a man and they were torturing him. It was very strange. Yeah, That is what the scene kind of sets up. And you're like, oh, dear God, this is gross. But the guy's bald. Looks completely hairless. He does not seem to be doing well. Not, not in it. And then he's like, one of the guys at the table says, oh, God, what is he doing? And he's like pulling out his insides. Yeah. I And it's like, okay. Is it blood or is it poop? Maybe it's both. It might be both. It might be both. And one of the guys says, he's just getting worse. (laughs) See, this is what Color Me Blood Red didn't happen. Have. Exactly. (laughs) It's poops in there. (laughs) Yeah, there's like, you got a little brown tinge to it, especially when it dries. It's a different color. Like, they they made some decisions. Um, Yeah. So then you see him, like, he's pulled out his intestines and he's... And then he just, like, is super focused and starts painting something in the walls with mm-hmm. this paint that he has. Mm-hmm. But the paint is obviously him. At some point, there's white paint. I don't know where the white paint comes from, but we'll get to that. And in- Oh, God. Was it Smurms? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Do you like good. how I said that with an M Smurfs? instead of a P? <laughs> what is Smurfs? <laughs> I was trying to swallow Sperms? down one. Were you trying to say Smurfs? Yeah. <laughs> I don't think it dries white. Uh, I guess it does it dry white. I guess it might. Ew. What oh, else no. is it? What else is white in the body? Bile? No. No, bile is yellow. I know that because I've had alcohol poisoning and I've seen what bile looks I... like. 
Is it? I'm glad you said sperms, though. <laughs> I was like, oh, sperms? Tell me more. Oh, sperms? Tell me less. Anyway, this guy's a tulpa. <laughs> so he he paints this weird figure on the wall, and then James looks to, I don't know if it's left or right. I don't know what uh, direction he looks in. But he looks in one direction, and he sees the painting on the wall, and he's like, oh, this is happening where I'm sitting. Cool, 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 cool. And the painting um, is the weird skull Thinky monster. Is it? I thought it was just like a white figure with... Nah, dog. It's big old monster from the Yeah, I wouldn't be shocked. I think that that logically makes sense. Um, And then he looks at the painting, looks back, and then the weird guy is just breathing and staring at him in the VHS, just being like... (laughs) And he, like, makes hella eye contact. Yeah, it's pretty rough. Definitely, and it was, like, um, black and white nighttime night vision. You see those big old pupils... Just right at him. Um, and then he gets, my notes are, he gets the heebie-jeebs, and he, he notices does. that the crusty bear is gone. So he's like, ah, oh, shit, bear uh, is gone. So then the next shot is him leaving the cabin, and then he starts to wander through the woods, crosses the creek, and he finds what looks like a ritual. It's like the end of the witch. You know, the vitch. Mm-hmm. The vitch. The vitch. The vitch. So we have the people chanting and dancing around this fire. Um, they seem somewhat synchronized, but they're dancing around this fire. Fire gets real big as mm-hmm. uh, James is looking at it. And then it seems like he's kind of tripping. He looks yeah. up at the Milky Way and he was like, this shit is great. I don't know. It seemed like he was on shrooms or something. And then he comes yeah, back down to reality. Yeah, the stars spin around him. Yeah, he like has but a I, moment. I do want to point out that the fire doesn't just get like normal big. Mm-hmm. It goes, like, up into the sky and oh, swirls yeah. around. Like, it becomes tulpa big? I don't it know. Tulpa big. It's tulpa big. <laughs> um, and then he 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 trips out for a second. And he was like, that was nice. He looks back. Fire dies down. He was like, okay, this shit's crazy. I'm going to leave. And then suddenly there was just complete silence. It's and so he was scary. Like, uh, I've heard silence before. I don't like it. Mm-hmm. And then he turns around and... Uh, there was a floodlight on when they were dancing around the fire. The floodlight is no longer on. Yeah. Um, they are creepily in a group, which is coming closer and closer to them. And then they They're like stop. in a weird column. Yes. It's not single file. They are just like bunched up in a specific grouping. Yeah. They're like four or five. That's so width, weird. And they're like snaking their way towards Probably the Probably like creek. 20 or 30 for the Deep, it's yeah. so weird and then he makes one step they make one step uh-huh and then he he says yeah no and then <laughs> runs and i was like this is another moment where you're incredibly relatable mm-hmm. and he yeah. just runs they start running after him like crazy not it's in a so single scary. file line they the ones that are faster are getting to the front it's a free-for-all and they're they're going he gets to his car and they're throwing stuff at his car. They're throwing, like, bottles. Where do they and get the And they're throwing themselves. Well, they're yeah. just carrying it for the ritual. Yeah, but they're throwing well. themselves on the car. They climb on the car and uh, gets – his car's not working. And then he gets his car working finally. And he, he backs out. And then he gets out. And then his immediate response is, what the fuck was that? What the fuck, what was, the fuck that? was that? But I want to talk about this for a second. So he reverses out of the camp and he reverses for so long. And the whole time he's rever- he's reversing, he's looking back behind him. Can you just think about how scary that is for a second? Oh, terrifying. Like, you know that all of these people are running after you and you can't keep your eyes on them. You have to look the other way. That's so scary. That's and the fact so that scary. he had to like... He's in the middle of the woods, and he has to find a spot to literally back his car into to go yeah, forward. So that he can reverse, Ooh. yeah. Ooh. So scary. Great scene. Great Very scene. intense. And then he goes to the sheriff's office and is like, this shit is what's going down. And they're like, was it open? Were the doors unlocked? Yeah, they're like, you could like you're trying this investigation. <laughs> yeah, they're like mad at him for trying to figure out what's going on. We're like, you're not investigating anything, brah. You're not doing it. James is doing the hard work. He's doing the legwork. He knows what's going on. You guys don't even know about the Pontifex Institute. Mm-hmm. Um, and they're talking to him like he's crazy. Then they tell him, look, you're not a cop anymore. Stop doing it. Yeah. Um, and then he's like, write a statement. And he's like, I feel like this is bullshit. And he leaves. 
And then he heads back to his work and he grabs some supplies. You remember he lives at, or he lives at, he works mm-hmm. at a tactical yeah. shop or slash gun shop. And um, he goes and finds Nora and he's like, you need to get the fuck out. He's like, I pissed off the wrong people. It is the Pontifex Institute. You know, watch like my phone. And um, it was like, you I'm need sorry, to skip town. what is it town. that you just. Oh, Scientology. Yeah, yes, yes. Okay. And he was like, you need to skip town. We got to like, get you L. somewhere Ron else. Hubbard himself is coming. <laughs> <laughs> and he was like, "We need you need to get somewhere else." So he takes her to a hotel, and then he drops her off. But in this scene, uh, he's describing the Pontifex Institute, and Nora is like, "Are you saying that Amanda joined a cult?" <laughs> like, yeah, um, like this is where she finally realizes that. Does she? I, well, who is she? Amen. Anyway, she exists, and even if it did exist. He tells her he thinks that the Pontifex Institute killed all of Amanda's friends. Mm -hmm. And while they're having this conversation, the phone rings and uh, Nora picks it up and she's like, nothing. I don't hear anything. But when James takes the phone, he hears that whisper whisper clicking. He hears that whisper clicking. And then, yes, he takes her to a hotel to to get her away from here. And he asked her and he asked Nora, does Amanda know about the thing that we never talk about? Mm -hmm. And she says, of course not. I would never tell her. It's in this scene that it becomes like clear Basically that they clear. had an affair. Yeah. Like it's been hinted at up till this point. Like clearly something was going on, but it's in this scene that you're like, oh, y'all banging. So you see these like flashbacks at this point as well on his drive home. And um, he wakes up again around three and he is still sleeping with his door open. And he then sees what looks like a trash bag. Oh, and he's I like, immediately the, thought it was a person. He was like, the fuck? I didn't leave trash out. I mean, that might not have been his thought, but that would have been my thought. Yeah. And he was like, I didn't leave trash out. And um, pops up, runs towards him. So yeah, that's so definitely scary. not a trash yeah. <laughs> So scary. Um, and then he regains his composure. Uh, it grabs at him. It runs over his bed and grabs at him. He grabs his bat and he stands up to go hit it. And then all of a sudden it's not there. Um, it's only day two. It finds you on day two, but it doesn't get you on day two. Then he gets a ring at the doorbell, and then Mm -hmm. that crusty teddy bear is sitting right in the front. Yep. And he's feeling crazy. Yep. Takes his dioxin again, or dachshund again. And then he puts on his wedding ring, and (gasps) day three. I did leave one of them. I love day day three. (laughs) Day three. (laughs) Okay, we're on day three. And he's stalking Neil, which is not his name. He's Neil knows Cassidy. Is Neil Cassidy. Yeah. Yeah. That's what I'm going to call him. Um, that is not his name in the movie. But it might as well be. It's Neil Cassidy. Currently, we see James following around Neil, and he has the crusty teddy bear sitting in the back. Like, he's taxiing him around. And he's, like, actively drinking whiskey in his front seat while he's driving. Yeah. He's losing his shit right now. Mm, um, yeah. And then he follows him to St. Louis Memorial Hospital. It looks super old and cool. It doesn't exist. I looked that mm, up. Bummer. And um, he follows the group up to a hotel room. Hotel Wait, room. sorry. <laughs> hotel room. Hospital room. You, yeah. What is wrong with me? <laughs> that didn't even register to me. What I, <laughs> what, okay. What, <laughs> what I wanted to talk about was this scene it's like a clown car like the it car that, pi- that picks up neil cassidy you know neil <laughs> drives around town and picks up so many people like every time somebody gets in the car i'm like where are they gonna sit and when they get to the hospital they like pull people out of the trunk like this yep. is and like it's six so people pile out of the back seat like so many people were squeezed into this car <laughs> I have had a car very similar to that. And I was like, oh, this is like my, I think that they had a Cadillac. I did not have a Cadillac. Oh, I was thinking of the Coog. Oh, yeah, the Coog. No, nah, it wasn't in the Coog. Uh, so they're in St. Louis Memorial Hospital. And he follows the group up to the hospital room. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. they go in and they he's just watching from a, a little bit of a distance. And they start chanting. And then they get on their knees. And then you basically see a man who is in a coma. So you can tell mm-hmm. that they're focused on him. And like bad coma. He's intubated. Not in an ideal state. And no. then we cut to outside of the hospital. And then we see James basically jumping out of nowhere and pepper spraying Neil and shoving yeah. him into his car. You know, like a predator doesn't do. Um, <laughs> and then we find out. 
<laughs> Wait, I, mean, I want to talk about this hospital room. Yeah. Did you recognize who this was? No, I didn't in the hospital room. Okay. I know that it explains it later, but visually it didn't, I didn't take, I don't think they looked similar enough for me to track it. No, they definitely don't look similar enough. I don't know how I knew, but the first time I was like, got it. I know who that is. I mean, I feel like you could logically put those pieces together and it would make sense because why would you have that? And then yeah, who else would it be? But like, but visually it's not a different, I think it's the same actor just with prosthetics, but it's not. I don't even know if it's the same actor. I felt like the whole thing was prosthetics. I felt like it was a, I felt like this was fake. Oh, you know what? Actually, maybe it's a different, they use, uh, it might be different. That was a part that was hard to get around, but I guess it doesn't matter. because <laughs> Nothing's real. And even if it was real, you can't understand it. And even if you could. And we're going to kind of get to that with yeah, we'll get uh, there. Neil Cassidy. <laughs> So um, he, yeah, so he he just uh, kidnapped Neil Cassidy. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Takes him to an undisclosed location near a train. And he's like, who are you are? And then Neil's like. Oh, oh wait. Sorry. I'm sorry. I hate to interrupt you no, again in the same description. But after he shoves Neil Cassidy into his car, he like looks up. He looks around on the street. And there are plenty of potential witnesses oh, and yeah. they are all glued to their phones yep not one of them looks up while he maces and shouts at and fights a guy into yep. his car <laughs> yep i was like oh yeah i mean society right society. that's how it is you we wouldn't live in a society really <laughs> just one of them um so then he ends up taking him to this other place and he's like explain yourself you, yeah. uh, I thought you were on my side. You're definitely not. And he was like, they told me to tell you this. Um, and then he starts speaking in lines that seem like they're embedded from the Pontifex Institute. And he's saying that he's, um, the guy in that room, it's an antenna and he transmits a frequency that only they can hear. And then he goes in to talk about dreams, fever, deja vu. It's this scene where I was like, I fully don't know what the fuck is going on what this movie is about yeah yeah he says that he's like an antenna tuned to frequencies we can only get through him he transmits we receive he transmits we receive is like the pontifex institute catchphrase like that's that's repeated throughout the movie and then he talks about he's like he's a prophet of the other and then he calls him he directly calls him the empty man Mm mm-hmm and then he says the only reality is that there is no reality. So it's exactly what Amanda's hearkening to, that there's nothing's real. Nothing is real. Once again, this movie is pushing pushing it at you. Nothing is real. Nothing is real. And then he's like, you're coming down with him already, aren't you? Mm-hmm. you got the itch to your brain. Yep. And you don't even know it. He starts talking about the noosphere, too. Oh, Okay. He says, um, the noosphere is the sum of all consciousness, not just human. So everything you've experienced, deja vu, nightmares, none of that is like created within your brain. That came from the noosphere. You're watching reruns. Like Yeah, he said it was that, like a documentary. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Like that comes from the noosphere. He does start talking about the empty man. He describes the the man in the hospital bed as a prophet. Yes. And that the prophet needs an empty man. Yes. And I didn't write down anything else and I wish No, that's it. That's what I have. I have prophet of the other, the empty man. And then he said, you're coming down with the itch. And he's like trying to hint at him what's going on. And he was like, Mm -hmm. this is happening, man. Um, The other thing I, I took down in this scene is that James is eventually like, Nothing you say makes sense. Where is Amanda? Amanda. And And Neil Cassidy, yeah, go on. She's on a bridge. And he says, what bridge? And he says, there's no bridge. Haven't you been listening? And he's like laughing. He's like, there's no bridge. It was like borderline Joker. Yeah, he was like, what do you? (laughs) He was hysterical. Like he, and you're like, what the fuck? And then James takes out his rage on Neil's face with his fist. And he's like, and he's laughing the whole way through the whole time, Ah! like a maniacal laughter. Like he's not feeling any pain. Pain doesn't exist. It doesn't. 
Um, and then James goes back to the Institute and he goes to the archives and he grabs Manifestation 14. Mm-hmm. So he goes back through those uh, glass floors, dim lighting, and he grabs that folder. And then he sees a bunch of info on himself. It's or him. James Lazen- La Sombra. La Sombra. Lazenbro. <laughs> Yeah, that's it. Lazenbro. James Lass- I have Jeremy Lazenbro. So yeah, like, that's pretty good. I just made it real <laughs> shitty. So James Lazenbro. Uh, Lassombra. <laughs> James Lassombra. And there's an art, like he looks to it, and there's an article that says, I grew up in San Francisco, or someone grew up in San Francisco, and there are pictures of his family, and a co- even the coupon from yeah, the, the beginning of the film that the he was at the Mexican restaurant. And um, it's like pictures of his kid and pictures of his wife. It's it's everything. And then there's a picture of him sitting mm-hmm. in that seat that you saw at in the flashes. Like yeah. he's just he's sitting there and he's like, "How the fuck did they get this?" And he's just kind of like, "What's happening?" It's very strange. He so while he's finding the pictures of like the life that he remembers, he's like, yeah. "How do you even have this?" And then he discovers the pictures of him in that tunnel, sitting in that chair that he's been dreaming about this was a point whenever uh brian was like oh that makes sense because brian. that's what the guy said he said i uh you've been here before it's nice to see you again and mm-hmm. i was like oh you could interpret it that way that makes sense like they're brainwashing it oh, oh like this okay. movie's about brainwash oh please tell me you guys have watched it by now because that's not what it's about. It's not. But that's uh, a way kind to of. interpret this scene. So then he's driving and having flashbacks. And then he's hearing the story of the empty man, day one, day two. And then he hears the whispers of, where were you? Where were you? And then he can hear about the brain itching again. Mm. And then he hears the chanting of, he tra- or, transmits, we receive. He transmits, yeah. we receive. So he's hearing all of these items at once. Um and then his drive is to the hospital to go see the antenna. And that's what I'm going to call this man for now is the antenna. Yeah. Um, and the nurse isn't giving anything up on the patient. She's like, I don't know much, ma'am. I, well, I'm just a she, lady. She starts off. I'm not just a lady. I'm just here um, doing my job. And then he's like, I don't give a shit. I'm a detective. Just let me cross him off my list. And she's like, well, I can tell you. He's been in the hospital for at least a year, and that he's a three to nine on the Glasgow scale, usually a three, which means he's unresponsive to stimuli, basically, but he's able to function on his own. And then she goes into a description of where he was before, where he got transferred to. She said 23 years ago, and this is where the timeline gets fuzzy, because we we find out soon that the timeline begins in 1995. Yeah. Um, 23 years ago doesn't make sense for 20. 20- 10. Was this movie set in 2010? Hold yeah, on. the beginning of the movie has a flash of 2010. Um, unless um, it happens over three years. No, it doesn't. It happens over three days. 13 years. Wait, it happens hold over on. Three days. Eight years. Okay, 95. Eight years for it to be 23 years? Hmm. So that's the part hmm. that I that okay. got me was the 23 years ago he was in Bellevue, then he transferred. Um, the nurse suggested she suggested there might have been experimental treatment and says he's a John Do- Doe. No one knows mm-hmm. his name, but he has a lot of visitors. And yeah. she said, hey, there's actually someone in there right now. Um, and then he looks back at the nurse and she's a little more sus this time. She's been sus this whole time. She's been like moderately sus, but not like extremely. But this time she was like, I disagree. I think that she was extremely <laughs> sus this But this time, time she's like straight in the eyes. Is this a man you were looking she's for? She's like, while she's telling him these details, she's like taking steps closer and she's like unblinking. And Chelsea can see that I'm doing like crazy yeah, eyes. Yeah, crazy eyes for sure. She becomes more and more unsettling as the scene continues. And she's like whispering. She's like. But I was like, maybe that's just how she plays the character. <laughs> no, dude. And this is also weird because it's a hospital and there's one nurse on call. For like that floor, the, yeah. The hospital is totally silent i there's mean the it's one a, it's, room that's occupied it's night shift if you go into a hospital during night shift there's not a ton of people around here's what else i'm saying about this hospital which we didn't cover earlier it's a gated hospital like james couldn't get in to the hospital he had to sneak in behind 
the clown car of Neil Cassidy and his friends. Like, this is not a real hospital. (laughs) I feel like we've established that. Uh, There might be people being treated. They're just not on that floor. I don't think there's anybody else Uh, in this hospital. (laughs) Uh, I don't know. It seems like the Pontifex Institute has a ton of money. So they probably paid for an entire floor and a specific nurse. And then we find out later there is an entire staff there. Specifically, yeah, I think, I think they are for that. Stuff. Yeah, they're yeah. all there for that person. So they may have rented out that entire, or may not have. It might not be. Yeah, I don't think it's a real hospital. Why anyway, would, why would the front <laughs> gates to a hospital be chained? It's St. Louis. No, high crime. No, that's a bad reason. <laughs> nope. <laughs> I agree. Um, private hospital insurance. You not don't, real. You know. <laughs> <laughs> um, but she says that there's a visitor in there, and he can go. In there, and and then she's like, "Is he the man you were looking for?" And he goes in, and he finds Amanda cutting mm-hmm. cutting the man's hair, and he asks, "What's his name?" And she said, "I don't know. Uh, I like to think of him as a carrier. He's he transmits, we receive." Mm-hmm. And, and she also she, talks about it in the form of like a virus or a disease. Yeah. yeah. And then he calls Nora to tell her he found out. He found Amanda and she was like, I, who the fuck are you? I don't know who you are. And then Amanda's like, you don't know what's real anymore. Right? Like you don't know what's real and not real. And he's like, what the fuck is going on? She's also talking about how this body, the carrier's body is weakening. A human Mm -hmm. body can only hold this power for so long. Yep. And then she, um, he starts to have a flashback. And then that's when we kind of, we find out that the, the antenna that we're looking at right now in that bed is Paul. Mm-hmm. I know we kind of alluded to it earlier, but that's Paul from You remember from the, the cold opening, the, the nor'easter the, opening. The blizzard opening. The crevasse <laughs> opening. <laughs> that is Paul. So Paul, Paul has been has been the antenna. He has been in that state for many, many a year. And he's like so skinny he's skeletal like especially after she shaves his beard yeah. he's so it looks like he's made of clay and that i think is combo atmosphere and yeah. combo practical effects <laughs> for sure um and then amanda tells him uh they tried to experiment they tried to create one they were mm-hmm. like he we needed another body for her for him to transmit to to be in so she was like she, we tr- we tried to do it we tried to make one it's been so long and then she goes on to be like did you know the brain can itch she kind of speaks in little pieces she doesn't give it all away at once i do want to make sure that we cover the dots here so mm-hmm. she's saying that the human body can only facilitate this carrier for so long mm-hmm. and so we decided to make a carrier that is not a human body mm-hmm. And she's saying, like, before Paul, we had 500 years to prepare. We had 500 years to get ready for this. And we don't have that kind of time now. So Paul has been here since 95, and it's 2010 now. So we need to, like, solve this now. So we started this experiment. And then she says, you must attach from a false reality detach you must detach from a false reality reality. and then she talks about a script that she created and she's basically like i made you Mm -hmm. you are from a script that i created and then she starts asking him questions and answering them in succession with him like what what high school did you go to and she was like you were born three days ago that's the so she's she's asking him this question these questions and she's answering in sync with Mm -hmm. him because she knows the answers and then she asks when were you born and he says like november 7th and she's like no three days ago don't you remember you went to a mexican restaurant yep she said you're our tulpa she says you're you're our empty man you're not your own man you're our man and isn't that a relief really that none which, of this, which I, but I feel like me. how how could you process that in that amount of time? That's a great question. I could not process that because you gave them so much background, and then she says the antenna can only penetrate through the cracks mm-hmm. of sorrow, grief, and guilt. And then she pauses and she says, "Fear. That's what we were missing. Yeah. So we built you this way. 
So Mm -hmm. they gave him this background of sadness, and then they gave him this horror story to make him this antenna. Um, And she says, what's the worst thing that's ever happened to you? And she knows exactly what it is because she wrote it. She She wrote that script. She wrote the script, yeah. Um, And then he has flashbacks of his wife and his son getting in a car accident off of a bridge while he's having an affair with Nora after her husband's funeral. And the fact that he can have the flashbacks Mm -hmm. of his wife and son careening off a bridge. Right? While he was elsewhere is like proof positive of Amanda's point. Like, oh my God, if I can remember this. I wasn't there. The tapping of the the quarter on the kid's teeth. mm -hmm. He remembered that. But I was like, why would he remember that? He wasn't there. Yeah, this whole scene is nuts. Amanda is like, we created you to be our new empty man that this entity from the Noah sphere can occupy. And he's having to like cope with that. Yeah, and I wrestle with it. When when she asks, um, isn't that a relief in some ways? Yeah. Part of me was like, yeah, that would be sick. <laughs> <laughs> like none of this ever happened. That chill, chill, great. chill, chill. That I don't have to excellent. I don't have to feel guilty about it. But I don't then, gotta go to therapy. I don't gotta unwrap trauma. <laughs> but then again, if he, he all of a sudden felt that way, would that make him an unideal empty man? Like, and I know she hugs him and she says, just let go. This is the end for you. This is your purpose. Yeah. Um, and then it's a it's a cut from this to him running outside. Yeah, there's like a series of memories and or hallucinations. And then he goes down into a tunnel. Mm -hmm. Um, that is very, like, it's wet. It seems like a basement. He finds that chair that he was born in, it seems like. Like, he he finds the chair, and then all of a sudden, he turns around and he sees... First, he sees, like, the skeletal figure. Yeah, this whole scene is very weird. So, we see him, and it's as though he's in the cave in the Himalayas where Paul found the skeleton figure. Yes, yeah. And then it's like he's in the tunnel... With the chair. Mm-hmm. It looks like one thing and then something else comes like bursting out of the wall. Well, it, like you see it like pull from the fingers and pull backwards. Yeah. It's, and then it's, come out of the walls the cloak mm-hmm. figure. So uh, he's one. He's going down this hall and then there's a skeletal figure comes at him. Does some weird transformation. Has tentacles? Yeah, it's like a Cthulhu thing. It like... <laughs> It raises him, him down. Up. <laughs> it's so crazy. This, yeah. So he's like the monster bursts out of the wall and he starts running and he's like in the the basement of the Pontifax Institute yes. in this memory and or hallucination. And this monster is following him and it catches him and it's it's there are tentacles like coming out of its body, then but it, then also out of its mouth. It's like ah. ectoplasm. It's like a weird like, ectoplasm, and then it turns into the ectoplasm and then inserts himself into James. Yeah, so, I wrote down Cthulhu oh. monster, and then it's like black vomit. Yeah, into accurate. James's mouth, which. There are a couple movies we could relate this to. Um, Is it Evil Dead, the remake, or is it the original as well? There's like vomiting into a mouth in that one. Happens in Supernatural too. Happens in Possession. It's not vomiting into a mouth, but there's like black. Not black. (gasps) Yes. Yeah. There are like moths that go into the mouth. Um, Haunting of Connecticut. There's like a weird ectoplasm. Don't watch that, guys. I'm doing you a favor. (laughs) It's bad. Do not. Anyway, so uh, it goes into, and I put in quotes, Jeremy's body. It's James's body. I know, but even in <laughs> quotes, it's in quotes. Because it is, is it quotes. his body or is oh. it his body? Oh, God, I don't know. I don't know. So he leaves. the pond Whose body is it? <laughs> Whose mind is it? Whose okay. world is it? Nothing is real. Nothing is real. They keep telling us that. And how do I, why don't I, why don't I believe them? And then he, he goes to his house. It's not his house. It's empty. It starts even before that. When he leaves the Pontifax Institute, his car isn't there. Oh, I didn't notice that. I was just like, it's real rainy, sad stuff. Yeah, his car's not there. And then he goes to his house and it's not his house. Um, And then I put all memories were a story that was just written for him. 
Um, all pieced together, the wife going off the bridge and then the empty man being being on the bridge and then saying that he is the bridge. All of it ties together in the end. There is no bridge! And then he walks to his bedroom and there's just this bright light around it. And he comes in and he's at the antenna, a.k.a. Paul. Mm-hmm. And... In take, the bedroom of his house. It's yes. Paul in his hospital bed with the intubation tube in the bedroom of his house. So it's the world's melding together because just like Amanda said, you can't tell what's real and what's oh, not. Nothing is real. And this is the moment where he goes in and then he has a gun and then he just... Pew, 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 pew. Like shoots the shit out of Paul's head. Yes. And, and this, it is hella practical effects. Yeah. And I was going to say, and the splatter... Uh, Looked like the painting that was in the cabin <gasps> previously. I didn't even notice that. Yeah, and there were also parts oh. wherever. Um, sorry, I, I like since this one, this is not a visual medium. There are there's a part where he goes into the hospital and he puts his hands down, and they're very much like that. Oh my god! Figure. And you know what? I didn't think about this until you just did that. When in the beginning of the movie, when Amanda is calling the empty man on the bridge mm-hmm. with her friends, she holds her hands like that around the bottle. Ah! There are so many <laughs> little parts in this movie. Third time, guys. Third time. We're gonna watch third, it third time. time, and we'll come back and we'll talk about it some more. <laughs> but yeah, he's like suddenly back and aware in the real hospital. And then uh, everyone, what is real? What is everyone real? in the ward gathers around him? People in suits, people in uh, medical uniform. Scrubs. And at first, you think like, "Oh, it's because he just shot that dude in the head." Yeah, but then they all drop to their knees and they bow. They bow to Jeremy slash James. His name He's is James. I'm sorry, man. guys. He's the carrier. And then they start saying, "You transmit. We receive." We receive. What the fuck is this movie? The best movie ever. I don't even know. <laughs> Listen, that's the end. That's how it ends. That's the that's end. That's the end of the movie. And then it kind of just focuses on his face and then it goes black. We skipped a whole scene. What? During his like hallucination flashbacks, he remembers being in the Pontifax Institute, mm-hmm. clutching the red folder with his information in it. How did I miss that scene? And he like enters into the big warehouse room where the people are, are like, because that's the bridge, when he was born. Comes the man from the man comes that. Yeah. That's when he was born. And he, he enters into this warehouse room and he, um, he's the one who makes the sound. It's yes. newborn James that makes from, the sound from, from the wedding ring. ring. He, and he like, Tip taps How it. did I miss that? So he makes the sound, and that's when the group who were like conjuring a tulpa, yes. uh, and they were blowing into their little bottles. That's when they're like, "Is somebody here with us?" And it was him. He was there with them, and like he's down on the bottom floor, and he's looking up at the other James being mm-hmm. escorted out of the warehouse but before the other james is escorted out of the warehouse he's like looking down because he mm-hmm. also heard the noise of his birth so like what i mean if time is a construct then all these moments are happening at once okay so it makes sense um, it? so his memory could still exist outside of that so even though time went on in his brain and his memory in the script post that moment it didn't really go on post that moment. I, w- okay, I could buy that, except <laughs> that the group conjuring the Tulpa reacts to script James. Mm-hmm. That mm-hmm. doesn't make sense to me. Like in, in one scene, the the conjuring group is reacting to both newborn James and script James. And in addition to that, newborn james see okay so is this like time layering itself i don't but i don't i don't feel like it is time layering itself i feel like the script and how he views it and how he views his past is all based on what they have said and i know that this is them conjuring him but because of the script that they wrote they knew that that was gonna happen but why would the script include him stumbling upon his own birth so here's the here's the part that really confuses me is newborn James with Mm -hmm. the wedding ring. He comes into this warehouse and Amanda is there. She's one of the people conjuring him. Is she? Yes. Oh, I didn't notice that. But, but script James, Amanda is not there. 
Mm. So are these two separate instances and somehow they're being overlaid? Oh, maybe. Like, I don't, I don't understand that. And then I don't understand like, like. And I was going to say, that's a good point. I think that's the most important part of the film. And I completely just glazed over it. Like it wasn't a thing. <laughs> I don't know that it's the most important part. Well, because I kept like, trying to tag down the moment that he was born. That's very critical in that like. Because last... I thought the first time he went in there, I was like, oh, that's when he's born. I was like, oh, he's talking to Nora. That's not when he's born. N- yeah, no, it's, it's the other James mm-hmm. on the first floor. And then I was like, is first floor, is like ground floor, first floor, is this like symbolism that I'm not understanding? Oh, interesting. I don't, I don't know. Yeah, that, that, that part is confusing. And I think that that is one that is kind of left up in, no, I don't think it's left up to interpretation. I think we have to watch it three more times. We've got to watch it so many more times. Okay, you guys, we're going to do a wraparound. And on the fifth time of watching it, we will revisit this film. Can we Uh, say eight or ten? Okay, we can do that. Eight or ten. <laughs> and we will do it. Is there a book I can order, Magic of Empty Man? Like, I don't... <laughs> I Please just don't understand. Like, uh, okay. So, for example, I understand mm-hmm. that they wrote into the script his affair with Amanda's mom. Mm-hmm. I understand that. We needed him to feel devastation guilt. and guilt mm-hmm. at the loss of his wife and child. I yep. understand that. Why the Chinese scene? I don't know why. What? Why the Chinese food scene? And how much of this movie was the script? How much of this movie was the script by the Pontifax Institute? I thought it was all of it. You think it was all of it? All of it aside from Paul. I think Paul was real. And then everything that happened after was the script. Aside from him leaving that chair and shooting Paul. So you're saying he didn't actually interact with the police. He didn't actually no, interact with the No, I don't think he Devara. did. I don't think he okay. interacted with anybody. So then my question becomes, why would the police be doing like Pontifax Institute stuff? I don't think they are. I think that it is ho- everything is solely in his head. I think that the right, part- right, right, right. No, I'm agreeing with that. Yeah, but yeah. in his head, the police were doing Pontifax stuff. Mm-hmm. Was that just to prime him? Yeah, because they had to make him scared. Because where's okay. the fear coming from, aside from the empty man being an entity that could kill people? Because I mean, they I needed guess I the thought fear. It was, yeah, I thought it was the woman he was involved with. I thought it was like fear for her and the loss of her daughter. Oh, that's nice. I don't. I didn't feel like it was that. Okay. I thought it was fear for a scary thing that was going to murder everybody. <laughs> okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I feel like that's a lot nicer interpretation. I. I think that he may have had feelings for Nora Nora and fear that something would happen to her. Maybe that is it. Maybe it was fear that she would, because he did take her to a hotel. Yeah, he was worried about her. And maybe that is the fear of the whole thing. And then, and the police investigating her would line up to that. So I think that your interpretation is probably more, more in line with that. I no, was just I like, no, I, I feel no, no, like maybe I, yours is. Well, I was, because there's an empty man that's a giant guy in a cloak that's attacking everyone. I'm sorry, I mean, this is Halloween. Part of it. <laughs> <laughs> but that's that's the part that I interpreted. But to your exactly to your point, like I think he cared about Nora and he didn't want her to get hurt. And a lot of it was about protecting her and trying to figure out what's happening to Amanda because I think he felt akin to her and he didn't want anything bad to happen to her. Um, I do think that that is because like, I don't know if he cared about himself that much. No, I. I I think you're exactly right that he didn't care about himself very much. I think that that's why he gave in to being the empty man so Mm -hmm. easily. Like whether or not the investigation part of the movie was real. And I think you're probably right that it, that it wasn't. I think that he believed it was real and was able to set that aside and like lean into being the new conduit. Mm Mm-hmm. Because he didn't care about him. He, not only did he not care about himself, but like his life had been so painful that it was like. A relief. Great. Yeah. Set that aside. I'll do this instead. Yeah. I I think you're right. Because I didn't, I didn't consider that point of view that the fear is not about fear for his life, but fear for somebody he cares about, which I think is more accurate. And they had to write that into the script for him. Because it had to not be about him. I wonder if that was what happened with um, 
Manifestation 13. Because they said that they did it with grief, sorrow, but they forgot fear. So that is something else I wanted to talk about. So in this last scene with Amanda, she says, we've tried this once before. Yeah, but why are there 13? But he's the 14th manifestation. Yeah. There are, maybe he, maybe he wasn't good with numbers. We know two years, one year has been a little messy. 25 years, 10 years, 15 years don't make sense. Numbers in this movie don't line up. But I, is it, is it like beyond us? Is it like if I, we take all the numbers, then we find out like, I don't know, Fibonacci's. Yeah. Is this like a numerology thing? Okay. So three plus one is four. So four (laughs) means (laughs) like four is symbolic in Freemasonry because it's, I feel like there's got to be more to, I feel like there has got to be something towards the numbers that we're not getting or not. I don't know if I'll dig deeper into this. Okay, so you think that the whole investigation was script? I don't think that there was any sheriff's office that was in existence outside of his brain. Okay. I don't think they existed at all outside of the script. I don't think any interaction with anybody existed outside of the script prior to him holding that folder and him tapping with his ring. Damn. So he like, whoa. Okay, so... so. This is he, how great the movie is. It keeps on giving. <laughs> he was born in that tunnel. Yeah. Just he was born like on, 10 minutes before. Like wiener hanging out. Yeah. Woke up, somehow got clothing and a wedding ring. Yep. Took his little folder into that warehouse and then immediately went to the hospital. Yeah. And shot it, Paul. He had all those memories implanted in him. Like he, he, Fuck. that's, that's his existence. He knows exactly the backstory that gets him to that point. Fuck, okay. That's the backstory that's given to him immediately. He wakes up and he knows all of the past and then he just goes okay. and does what he do. Yeah, okay. That makes sense. That yeah, makes that's sense. How, that's how I interpreted it. That makes total sense. You know, do you remember earlier when I was like, I think that you understand something that I don't? This is it. <laughs> Well, that's because I took very detailed notes, but I also but forgot I the most. Too. But I forgot the most <laughs> pertinent scene, and that was him coming back with that file folder because that was when he was born. That, was that when moment was when born. he comes back with his file folder—that yeah. was his birth. I know she mm-hmm. says you were born three days before. He didn't exist three days before. So, but that his memory was born three days before. I think that that's what I got hung up on. Yeah. Why wouldn't she just say you were born twenty minutes ago? No, okay. So she so she was in the warehouse mm-hmm. summoning him yes. at his birth. So you're saying that she summoned him and then when when she heard the spooky noise, she immediately went to the hospital? No, I think I'm not that saying she, she was at the hospital. I'm saying that that might have been part of the script. Oh shit. Okay. Yeah, every piece of it might have been part of the script and there was an expectation that at the end he realized Mm. He was supposed to be a conduit for the empty man or the not empty man, the antenna man. I don't know what it is. Okay. Yeah. Anyways, guys, go watch this movie if you get a chance. So everyone, the next movie coming up on our <laughs> series is going to be The Brood. Neither of us have seen it. The original. Seen it. Yeah. The 70s version. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, we're both looking forward to it. And we're going to see if we cry or we laugh. Yeah, we'll find out. Is this going to be... We're both very emotional. Not me. I'm very emotional. (laughs) (laughs) Thanks for tuning in. We will continue our theme of tulpas next week when we talk about The Brood, and y'all should definitely join us. It's a fun flick you can find on HBO Max or for rent on Amazon, non-spawn. And hey, if you're liking the show, it would be exceedingly dope of you to rate and review us. And you know what? Tell your friends. As always, you can find us on Twitter at NoShowMonster, and our email is NoShowMonster at gmail.com. See you next week. Happy Spookies.